to episode 101 of Cogent Conversations, where we interview innovative tech leaders. Today, we're going to be direct and to the point with Pete Jimison, CEO of Frequency. Frequency is an audio creative management platform designed to make the audio channel more efficient and effective for publishers and marketers. Pete is a grandfather in the audio space, having started in it way back in 2009. You'll want to stick around to the end because we will be getting a lay of the land first and then dig into measurement and how you can get started in this space. So Pete, tell us about your career and what led you to start Frequency. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, I'm excited to be here and, and doing this with you. Uh, so um, basically my background was uh, digital production and uh, started first agency in like 2010. Uh, was working on apps, mobile apps and web apps uh, for clients uh, like Viacom, Vice, et cetera. Uh, then we got connected into the audio space, working with Spotify, and we started to build out applications that were more immersive using music. Um, so started to play around you know, with uh, builds that leverage music and audio uh, and realized while we were doing that, there was this massive opportunity in the audio space, uh, burgeoning space uh, around ad operations and ad creatives and how to streamline that process and how to enhance the creative to get a better return for marketers. Uh, so that's, you know, in around 2017, after a lot of uh, uh, experimentation and actually launching a platform within uh, the, the agency that we were running at the time, um, we spun it out as Frequency. Um, and now that is a standalone SaaS platform, uh, creative management system for the audio space. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Pete. And for the, for the folks listening in here, um, you can feel free to put some questions in the in the chat here and we'll address them at the end of the webinar so obviously the audio channel has been around for a long time a little fun fact it actually started on november 2nd 1920 when station kdkq made the nation's first commercial broadcast they chose that date because it was election day and the power of radio was proven when people could hear the results of the harding cox presidential race before they read about it in the newspaper did you know that pete uh, I did not know all that. <laughs> uh, I did my homework. So, yeah. so the, chat, <laughs> the channel's obviously evolved a lot since 1920, but how's, right. it evolved, how's it evolved for listeners in recent years when it comes to terrestrial or streaming audio or podcasts? Yeah, I mean, well, terrestrial, uh, you know, it's interesting, is now really going digital, right? So you can hear the streams online. Uh, so all these radio stations that you grew up listening to whether you're in the car, uh, you know, going to some activity or some location like uh, school or work, uh, now that's all going digital, right? And so that content that people are used to consuming with terrestrial FM, um, AM, or, and actually, I would even say satellite with XM, uh, now that's, you know, consumable, downloadable podcasts. Uh, you still have the, the terrestrial element, still a huge listening base um, with terrestrial. Uh, but a lot of those broadcasters realize that the future is in digital. Uh, and with podcasts specifically, it's been largely a downloaded form of con audio content. And now that's really getting closer towards more of like a 50-50 split between downloaded and streamed. Uh, and that's going to continue to pick up as people are you know, seeing accessibility with advances in technology like 5G. Uh, and then lastly, I would say, you know, the streaming music element of what we're used to with streaming which now is really bringing on much more around spoken word content, you know, that's starting to mix. And so what I think is really kind of fascinating is this idea that, you know, we were originally listening to radio stations, terrestrial stations that had DJs that were having spoken word content and then mixing in music. And now we're going back there, but with streaming uh, and opening it up to many more stream uh, DJs or curators. So this idea of, you know, really a, all audio content um, with music and spoken word and you know, bringing those together um, and making it more accessible for creators or curators uh, and then having a, you know, all these channels now that exist via these apps. Uh, so that's, that's and essentially, you know, things have advanced very far from 1920. Um, <laughs> but I guess as we'll talk about, you know, the, the interesting thing is the, the monetization stuff has, has not yet caught up. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's one of those channels that's, you know, it's what's old is new again, and they're sort of all melding right. together, um, which explains why we've seen a lot of consolidation in the industry over the last, you know, year or so. So can you talk about some of these acquisitions and who the major players are and how they differ from each other in terms of their strategy um, and their business? Yeah, I mean, so 
you know, largely people have seen this uh, audio content in three separate channels, like I just described, radio, streaming, and podcast. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, each one of those has different distribution me mechanics, right? So with radio, you have the distribution over the actual radio stations themselves, you know, servers now locally at station level. Um, with podcasts, you're doing that largely with RSS feeds. Um, and with streaming, you know, that's, that's standard through these applications, web apps and, and mobile apps. So what you're finding now is that it's basically, there's a lot of changes happening in terms of uh, the players and what they're looking to uh, obtain from their listening audience in terms of that content being roughly the same in a sense, like the content and the way that we create that content uh, and the type of content is the same. It's just the distribution me me mechanics that are different. Um, and so what we find is that there's, you know, players like iHeart, which has over 800 radio stations in the US, has a large podcast network and, you know, it has a streaming app, iHeart Radio. Uh, now they're acquiring, you know, uh, uh, other companies um, and specifically building up that base to support uh, all that content across podcasting, streaming, and terrestrial. Uh, and then you have, you know, other uh, players in the space like Pandora with their match with Sirius, and they're acquiring other companies like SimpleCast and Stitcher and kind of growing their base of uh, a technology stack that can provide to their audiences, that listening audience, which they have had from, let's say, Radio XM, et cetera, and now it's bringing more towards streaming and podcasts, they want to continue to attract that attention of that audience, but also grow that audience. So, you know, I think what we're seeing in terms of acquisitions from the content standpoint, you really have uh, a number of these, you know, broadcasters looking at how do they expand their portfolio of content across uh, podcasting and streaming and, and continue to cater to that audience that they've had and grow it. Um, and then you have, Interesting enough, you know, this uh, kind of a, a, you know, play coming in from streaming and digital, like your Spotify's of the world, um, who are building from purely digital and expanding out from there. So it's interesting. So it's not just the terrestrial players buying streaming and podcast companies. In some respects, sometimes it's the, the terrestrial buying up the others, or it's even someone like a Spotify who started in streaming and they're sort of going up and buying radio stations and going down and buying podcasts. Yeah, it's, well, Spotify's not really going up and buying radio stations. They're, they have a completely different, I think, uh, perspective, right? They come in from a digital perspective, knowing that everything's going digital, right? Mm -hmm. And so, give you an example, in, in Switzerland, uh, the FM stations will no longer be available past 2023. And that's wow. kind of happening across other markets as well. So what you're seeing is this transition from terrestrial to digital. Now, in the U.S., that's a longer time horizon, right? So you're going to have, uh, you know, the iHearts and Odysseys and Cumuluses of the world that still exist with all these radio stations for foreseeable future for, at this point. But then as technology advances, especially in the car, um, and as people are, are accessing this content more and more digitally, naturally, they're going to go that direction as well. Um, so I'm not sure if I'd... Yeah, I just think, I think about as, as if you're like an iHeart and you... And you're buying up companies, right? Obviously, um, from a from a corporate perspective, you you have to show you have to justify that, right? And so right. You, have to, you have to grow revenue. So uh, when when a company like iHeart buys a streaming company or a podcast company, are they essentially talking to the same people, or are they expanding into new markets um, within those different sub channels, if you will? So are they, sorry, say that again, are they? Are they yeah, yeah, yeah. So like certain people, like I don't listen to the car, I don't listen to the radio. If I listen to the radio in the car, it's XM. I don't listen to AM, FM. Some people exclusively listen to AM, FM. Some people prefer podcasting when they get in the car. So so when a company like iHeart is gobbling up different companies, are they are they thinking about expanding their audience or do they, or is the belief that the their current audience is going to be playing or listening in all three arenas? Yeah, I mean, so I'm not the expert on this, but I would say that the, typically you see there is overlap between listening audiences in terms of terrestrial podcasts and streaming. And especially as you skew younger from an, an audience perspective, those listeners are still listening to radio, but they're doing a lot more consumption in the digital realm, right? And, 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 and then podcasts and, and streaming. So, you know, I mean, I think in terms of 
you know, what their objectives are, I can't speak for them, but I, I, I have a feeling that they're looking to continue to engage that audience that they've had, which is probably getting older and engage a younger audience that's, you know, doing more listening on the streaming applications and, and with podcasts. But also, I mean, it's a mix between the two. And I, I you know, you probably, my, I know my, my father, for instance, listens to podcasts, right? And he's in his mid seventies. Um, and so, you know, you've got, and, and has streaming applications that he uses. And it's not just, you know, one streaming application. Some users actually have multiple. I think um, there are a few people that actually will have, um, uh, you know, their preference uh, and they kind of stick to it. Uh, but then there's some that are actually using many different applications. So again, I don't know if that answers the question. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you mentioned, you mentioned Switzerland earlier um, and the phasing out of FM radio. Will the, will the big players here that are leading the consolidation, will they, do you think that they'll be looking outside the U.S. for growth? Yeah, I think and this is what this has kind of been fascinating for me is, is what happens next. Um, you know, you think about these these global players like an iHeart. When I say global players like iHeart, iHeart's been licensing in Canada and Australia, um, but they, you know, their reach only goes so far in the U.S. So my thought is, well, how do they continue to grow in terms of revenue opportunity? And they've developed and they've acquired a lot of technology that is global, specifically on the monetization front. And they've got that as kind of a backbone. And so where are they looking in terms of new opportunities? And I think there are, you know, relatively quick, uh, and well, not quick maybe, but relatively short distance opportunities that could be in markets like Europe, uh, you know, Latin America, other, other places for them where, uh, they can expand off of that global footprint from a monetization standpoint and acquire or run through opportunity with content. So you're basically looking at how you can add content, much like, you know, you, you kind of look at the, the TV model with Netflix or Hulu, et cetera. It, it's the same backbone infrastructure. It, the content, the culture, yeah. everything's different. And so there's, there's legal implications, there, you know, there's cultural implications, political implications that come into play when you're talking about the content. But when you have the same tech infrastructure and from an operational standpoint, it might make it easier to scale and to look globally. And I think primarily terrestrial radio has been a domestic game. It's been market specific, whereas streaming has not been, right? So if you think about Spotify, Spotify is a global company in what, 80 plus markets, I can't I mean, know now uh, across the world. But when you compare it to iHeart, iHeart's very specifically much more focused in the US. Same with Pandora and Sirius. So I think what you're gonna see is these juggernauts like Pandora and, and iHeart start to expand and look outside of just the US. Um, exactly. Whereas like Spotify has to compete with each and every player in those local markets, right? So they're looking at uh, Ghana and Savin in India. They're looking at Deezer in markets in Latin America and France. Um, so it, it does, it, it's a different ball game for them in certain respects, but obviously the US is the biggest market. All right, that makes, that makes total sense um, when, you, when you frame it up that way when it comes to the technology. So let's focus yeah. on the monetization given, given all of that with these advancements, with the expansion um, across the sort of the different sub channels, how's ad spending in, in the sector expected to grow when you, when you look at all three, uh, streaming, terrestrial and podcasting? Uh, how's ad spending expected to grow across those? Oh, three? yeah. How's how's ads how's yeah. ad spending expected to grow within those channels? So, I mean, terrestrial is basically, from what I understand, going to remain flat. It's, I think in the U.S. has primarily been around 16 billion um, annually. Uh, streaming and podcasts are growing. Podcasts, especially in terms of percentage, uh, you know, this last year was about 850 million uh, in the U.S. and it's expected to be 1.1 billion this year. And then about five years from now, it's supposed to be three, three and a half billion. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be even more than that. Uh, I think, you know, just kind of what's, what's happening in the space in terms of consumption, uh, in terms of the, the, the people going in, in terms of investment uh, from content standpoint, because we were just talking about, and then also from the marketers that are following suit. Uh, you know, marketers are kind of behind, actually, in terms of the opportunities that exist. And so it's still undervalued um, as a medium for, for advertisers. Uh, and actually, IAB didn't even start measuring uh, podcast uh, revenue specifically as its own channel until about 2016. 
So yeah. you know, it's a, that's, that's a short time frame for we are today, where it's already a, a $1 billion uh, market and growing massively. Yeah, and I, and I have to imagine too, I mean, I know we've had conversations uh, internally here and with some of our members around, okay, well, if measurement and tracking is all broken with IDFA breakage and cookie loss and all that stuff that's going on with AEM uh, on yeah. Facebook, we might as well explore some other channels and look at some of the more traditional types of measurement, whether it's brand studies or uh, website visitation lift, uh, in-store lift, that sort of thing. And so we're hearing more chatter around the audio channels, the out-of-home channels, um, even direct mail, like th those categories that um, maybe aren't, or haven't been as directly measurable as say display, but um, there, are, there are tactics inside each of those channels that give you a pretty good read whether it's working or not. So, um, yeah, that, 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 that bodes well. So I agree with you in that, that, that the ad spending is probably higher than what the projections are. I wanted to get your thoughts on an ad exchange article. It's very timely. Um, it was written last week by a, um, a custom research manager at the New York Times. And in the column, she shared several interesting facts. So I would say go check it out on ad exchanger. But she highlighted three things that should get marketers excited about advertising with audio. Um, she talked about new attribution players, smart creative, and audio being more than a direct via, direct uh, response vehicle. Um, can you share your thoughts on some of these topics with some historical context? So let's start with creative um, and the different yeah. creative types. Yeah, yeah, so uh, I mean, she makes a uh, good point. You were saying the attribution, smarter creative. Uh, and, and it's not, well, it's it, not, yeah, it's not just a DR vehicle. And it's not just a DR vehicle. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, smart creative is, is Right on. And that's what we really, that's the world that frequency operates in. You know, the, the, the creative has largely come from, again, terrestrial radio, right? So what people have typically heard in, in streaming or podcasts even, a lot will change in the last few years, but has been primarily that radio style ad, right? Your 15, your 30, your 60 second ad. Uh, and that's not bad, um, but you got to adopt kind of new standards for the context of the listener. And uh, instead of being in the car passively listening, now some of these people have their, you know, their Air, AirPods or their earphones in, and they're much more engaged or it's much more intimate type of setting, right? So that's that's one of the beautiful things about uh, the, the audio space is that it is very intimate, especially with like podcasts. Um, and so what you find is that the creative needs to adapt to that the medium and to to what's happening within that content. And so specifically with like New York Times, you know, if you listen to the daily, if you listen to any of these podcasts, you know, like Kara Swisher coming out with the sweat with Sway, uh, those podcasts, they have, uh, they're, 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 they're channeling different types of creative in the way that they handle it from a voice acting standpoint, whether it's host red ad, a producer red ad, or they actually have con uh, like voiceover talent that they're leveraging in-house or uh, just on a consistent basis to keep the consistency and to keep quality the same. Uh, and that's really important. You find the same thing happening with NPR. They have basically like two or three voices that you're going to hear consistently for every single spot. Uh, and then they really focus in on, okay, how are we going to help drive that message home for marketers? You know, what the CTA is and, and how that is spliced up in the actual content. So, you know, typically with podcasts, you have your pre-roll, your mid-roll, your post-roll, right? You also have your in-content in read, your sponsorship in, inside the content. Mm -hmm. uh, and Frankly, I think that's going to be over time changing as well um, as we, you know, play around different types of technology. Uh, but the interesting thing is that's now being dynamically inserted. So the, the actual ads, uh, instead of having them baked in within the content, when you download that podcast, right, as before, it would be with that podcast forever for every listener. Now, the dynamic insertion allows for that ad read to change based on whoever that listener is. And each time that person actually pings the server to connect with that podcast. So you can do much more things around targeting. Um, and, you know, that opens up a lot of things around the creative, right? So now when you're considering the targeting, when you consider the context of the listener, now the creative can come much more to life. And that's another part of what, you know, frequency does is thinking about the context of the listener and how do we, you know, take advantage of things like, you know, the weather outside or the time of the day or the location of the listener you know, all sorts of different factors, the sports scores. Um, that's going to be more relevant today with streaming. And over time, uh, you know, podcasts, as that goes more into the streaming, uh, you know, in terms of consumption, will also have those elements uh, that we can explore with creative. 
Are you, are you able to give us an example? Because you hit on some key points there, like the, the, you know, the context of the user, the weather, that first party data, that third party data. Can you give me an example of something that maybe you've either heard or even, even executed on frequency that really capitalizes on all of those um, available benefits? Yeah, I mean, we're running campaigns all the time right now for you know, big retailers that have many locations uh, and you know, changing the content based on those locations. So you know, based on the proximity of the listener, to specifically store locations, they're going to hear that call out to which one they should go to. Um, you know, and that could be a, a radius of five miles, 60 miles, what have you. Um, but that just makes it a little bit more um, personalized for the listener, right? And, and hearing that, oh my, you know, wait, I'm in, in New York City and on this block, and I'm hearing about, you know, the Best Buy that's just down the corner. Um, so we've done, I'm not going to name, I mean, I guess I can name a few, but we've done, you know, brands like uh, Academy Sports, AutoZone, um, you know, we've done some banks. Uh, those guys have done a lot of this type of, you know, creative based on uh, these types of data signals. Uh, uh, AutoZone specifically, you know, is using weather uh, so that they're, they're triggering uh, the, the creative for products based on and services that they offer based on what's the weather outside. If it's hot outside, then maybe you should be thinking about your battery. If it's raining outside, then you should be thinking about your windshield wipers. Uh, you know, and so that's, that's how you can really kind of change the creative to fit the context. And, you know, with that, that the article and talking about smarter creative, really that's a, a large part in the future of audio and what you're seeing, and it's already happened in the last five, 10 years in digital with social uh, and, and, and display. Now that's actually coming to play in audio. So we're just a little bit behind, I see. but I think, and I think that's the thing about marketers is that they always think they've always thought about the advertising and audio as a, uh, in a certain way, right? Whether it's brand awareness or they thought about podcasting as BR, direct response. Now you can start to see there's actually other opportunities here and you can, you can there's, a, there's, a, there's brand awareness and performance and there's a mix and you can take advantage of all of it in audio. Yeah, I remember hearing an ad once where I think it was for a sandwich shop and they said uh, they, they were across the street from the Safeway rather than, you know, at the intersection or, or the street or the address, right? They said across the street from the Safeway on Broadway, right. Or right? Like it was easy to find that way. I didn't have to get out my map and type in an address. So that was, that was helpful. That's right. Yeah. Um, so you said this a few times that, you know, it's, it's, it's a digital channel, right? It's much more digital minded in terms of the execution. How is measurement change within the audio space, given, you know, comparing it to sort of digital media? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's, what's great about kind of being last to the game, last to the, you know, the ball game, essentially, with, you know, measurement, because we are, we, we're behind, is we're basically applying what's already been there now, and, and using that for, for our own sake. So like attribution, whether you're looking at, you know, um, in-store traffic or website traffic and, you know, where, who gets the, att the attribution for that campaign, uh, that now is, there's more players in the space um, that you can, you can leverage. Uh, and so that's helping in terms of driving growth and opportunities. And I think marketers now are starting to become more aware that there is these measurement tools in place. Uh, you can start doing things around lift incrementality um, where you can, you know, compare a PSA or, uh, you know, a control group of listeners uh, across other uh, advertising to your campaign uh, and really start to break up those segments and start to do comparisons and, and also like geo matching, right? And, and seeing how it compares across markets. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I was going to ask you like, are people using mobile location data to sort of do that, that kind of incrementality or lift testing? Or is it mere geo match or is it, is it sort of a mix or are people trying to figure out what the best methods are? Um, what's the consensus today? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of all over the map, to be honest. Um, but there, there is definitely some, some players that are coming and becoming more prominent in the audio space um, that you, could, you can use, um, like Chartable or Pod Sites and these guys that really help in terms of thinking about attribution. Um, and so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know if I can speak specifically to what you were saying before in terms of using mobile devices, but um, yeah, they, you know, I think, I think measurement um, is interesting uh, as well because you have this spread of media in the audio space generally that goes across multiple different platforms. And 
you end up working with a number of different players, right? There's not that, that consolidation that's happened still has created these walled gardens. And a lot of the advertisers want to work within each. They want to target an audience. They don't want to just go on Spotify or Pandora individually. They want to look at an audience across all. So when you're thinking about measurement, you also have to consider how do I look at measurement in an aggregate form, consolidated, and leveraging tools that can do it, you know, via the, all the publishers. Um, so I mean, that's you know another another aspect I think that we're seeing in terms of solutions today is you know running campaigns that are consistent not only from the creative standpoint, but then being able to pull back in great measurement and reporting across your whole campaign, no matter where you distribute it. Uh, so. Yeah, so you're evolving and digital is devolving <laughs> with the loss of the cookies. Yeah. So right. we'll, we'll meet somewhere in the middle. All right, let's help, uh, let's help, let's help the audience uh, understand like how they get started, right? Like, what are the basics, um, basic things to consider when they're, um, when they're considering whether it's terrestrial in, in a digital fashion, streaming or or podcasting. So first of all, how does someone decide where to start? Should they start with all three? Should they start in one? Like, what do you what do you recommend? Where have you seen success? Yeah, it, so it really depends on the objectives. First off, you got to think about what, what is your brand objectives, right? Because each one of those channels has its own benefits, right? So you still have great reach with radio, terrestrial radio. You've got much more targetability with streaming as we were talking about before, targetability and activation of streaming. And then with podcasts, you know, you have these niche audiences with each of these shows, but sometimes they're harder to find and determine like which ones should you be across. So each one has its own benefits. And so you got to really think about um, what are my objectives and then how do I activate based on those objectives uh, across those channels. And I would always recommend considering all three. I wouldn't just dive into one or, or you know, just looking at podcasts, for instance. And that often happens. We talk to these, you know, these brands who are like, oh yeah, you know, we tried uh, streaming and we went to Spotify or we went to Pandora and you know, we ran a campaign. And that's what a lot of brands do today because they have the brand equity of Spotify and Pandora in mind. And they're like, oh, that, that makes sense. Uh, and there's solutions that these publishers provide in each one of them. And I'm not saying they don't do a good job. But again, when you're thinking about your audience, they're everywhere, it's not just those one or two specific platforms. Um, so, you know, I think they considering which channel, which uh, what your audience looks like. And so how can you attack your audience based on I shouldn't say attack, but how do you how do you go after that audience uh, based on the uh, uh, those publishers? Because some 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 publishers have a greater uh, spread of, let's say, an older generation or more rural, um, you know, demographic versus more coastal, uh, you know, so, you know, knowing that and having that in mind, that's going to also tailor your media decisions and to where you go. Um, and then, you know, I think also the, the CPM is different, right? So you have um, radio, which probably can get probably towards your cheaper CPM. Um, it varies based on, you know, the types of national, local, et cetera, to streaming where you probably are playing on the range of average of, you know, 12, 15 on up with your iHeart, Spotify, and Pandora's. If you throw in, you know, some of these, these networks, these aggregators that have multiple publishers, which we always recommend, um, like your, your DAXs of the world, you know, that can help your effective CPM which can bring it down, you know, maybe closer towards seven, eight bucks um, when you're, when you, instead of, you know, uh, of spending the, the, you know, almost double. And then with podcasting, you know, you're in the range of 25 to 50 bucks CPM on average, depending on, on the show. Um, some shows actually still do flat rates. So I don't know if that, if that helps, but you know, when, when you're considering it first as objectives, then it's, you know, which channels to consider within those channels, which partners to, to consider, how are you going to buy it? And then how, what's that effective CPM look like? And then I guess the last thing would be, okay, now that I've under, ident identified all that, what type of creative should I run? And it really then comes down to having consistency in your creative and your messaging and making sure that when you're activating, you know, instead of going and touching, talking to each one of these partners, they might just do the creative for yourself. Consider doing it on your own, perhaps with a partner like Frequency or, or you know, another um, creative management platform that can help you produce quality creative and then distribute that across those different channel partners. No, I think that's good advice. I think 
when you go um, when you go directly to the vendor, whether it's a Pandora or Spotify or iHeart, obviously they have their their interests at heart, right? And they're not necessarily going to align with your with your strategy. So it's really important to have that strategy laid out first and know that there are there are ways to execute it. If if one vendor can't do it, others can. And so understanding the space, having a good advocate is uh, is going to be key. Um, you, you got ahead of me on the on the creative question, and I wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit more because I have to imagine creative is one of those things that it could be scary for a marketer in a space like audio where they haven't done it before, right? And so um, it, it, maybe it seems costly or challenging or difficult, or how do I get the talent or the script writer? And for some, maybe a mid-market or, or a direct-to-consumer brand, they might have those resources that a big agency or a big, a big conglomerate might have. What are... What, is there like we're working with frequency? Is there a way like you can dip your toes in there without a major commitment? And how would you go about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, if you go to your Spotify's again, your Spotify's, your Pandora's, your iHeart's, they're going to produce the creative oftentimes as a value add um, by going directly to them. Uh, but then if you go to multiple, you have to you know deal with the inconsistency and in the, in the, the quality. Uh, you know, there are avenues like what we do is we offer um, a number of different vendors that you can work with through our platform uh, and we we keep that production price point low uh, and so enabling you to do more with what you what you receive uh, and we give you those options so if you want to take it up to like you know one of those more expensive type of agencies in terms of production you could um, but we you know you're, you're basically providing uh, vocal talent options for music bed, sound effects, and then all that production within a system um, to then, you know, distribute that same good quality, uh, consistent content. Um, and so, yeah, you know, the, the, the creative itself, uh, it's one of the hardest things for these brands. They see it as like a, 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 a not a heavy lift. They maybe haven't done it before. Um, and so really identifying you know, what those the, the brand's objectives again are and how can we match those objectives with the right creative and build out that story. Um, you know, we, we can help them essentially figure out what the creative will sound like and then, you know, make sure that it's relevant for the context of the listener, no matter where they're distributing. And if it needs to change, whether it's the vocal talent or whether it's the message, uh, then we build that into the process. So, you know, it really starts from taking a step back again and thinking about what am I trying to accomplish in the audio space and then planning your creative appropriately. And brands, I think um, to this, at this point, a lot of brands that are kind of just dipping their toes in, they see that as, you know, uh, a bit, uh, more difficult than, you know, just running your typical social media campaign. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the case. And we can make that easier. We can make that easier for them uh, to, you know, to, to build your specific audio ad. Um, and, you know, and, and the other thing is, you know, the, when you go to a, a demand side platform, um, you know, working with like your trade desk, your media maps, uh, they can't offer those, those solutions. And so you, you do need to find a solution um, for creative. And I think one of the beautiful things about, you know, working with a system like a creative management system is that we're hooked into the media serving aspect and we have the creative knowledge of how to produce the right creative. If you go just to an agency separately to produce your creative, there's still a disconnect between what that creative is being built and where it's being distributed. So you know, trying to match those two worlds, I think is really important. I think that's going to be happening more and more as this space evolves. Uh, and one of the solutions that we want to provide is, you know, for a brand, all in one, soup to nuts. I get my creative built based on the objectives I have. I, I, I can find the right distribution points and change the creative based on those distribu distribution points, based on the context of the listener, and then execute my campaign, see that report, in one central place and be able to activate, have optimization uh, based on the performance of the campaign. And, and they get your free consultation in terms of uh, strategy. Free consultation, that's right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what does that infrastructure look like? So you talked about how 
you know, you use frequency as sort of that creative platform and you, you plug into the, all those buying platforms, right? There's buying, buying partners, whether it's the Trade Desk or Spotify or Pandora, creative right. gets built on frequency. But what does that ad serving, tracking and optimization structure look like within this ecosystem? Uh, yeah, so I mean, basically you have, in terms of ad servers, uh, there's three big players. There's your, your AdWiz, your Triton Digital, and your Google. You know, Google is still uh, a player, even though they really haven't made anything specific for audio. Um, and uh, now those guys have both been acquired. And when I say both, I mean AdWiz and Triton. They've both been acquired. AdWiz is now owned by Pandora. Um, so they're in that kind of tech stack. Triton's owned by iHeart. So they're kind of being put into that tech stack. But, you know, the, each one of those has many different clients, many different publishers uh, that are using them. And so from a, an ad serving standpoint, if you go to a publisher directly, one of those, those publishers are going to be using one of those ad servers. Uh, but the capabilities are quite relatively same. Uh, and then you have your DSPs of the world. Um, like I was just mentioning, like Trade Desk or Media Map. Most of those DSPs now are connected to largely all the same SSPs um, in terms of activating your campaign in, in the audio space. So there's not going to really going to be too many problems or, dis, or um, issues between one and the other. You're going to pretty much get the same um, opportunity in terms of serving the creative. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think in terms of ad serving, that's the, the makeup, what we're missing today. And I think what I, is exciting in the future is one platform to help one, maybe some of the smaller brands that don't have a seat on these DSPs. I mean, we really do recommend that type of audience first approach, right? And leveraging a DSP to activate your campaign. Um, instead of going direct. Now you can go direct and there's no problem doing that because you can maybe get some additional benefits, um, some premium formats that maybe you wouldn't get doing programmatically through a DSP. But I would say that if you're, you want to have that kind of audio experience where you're able to optimize, you're able to provide really nice creative based in the context of a listener across a huge listening base, no matter what the publisher is, then you want to do that through a typical type of DSP. So I think what it's exciting also to think about how we're going to be able to respond and, and help the, the smaller brands that maybe don't have a seat and want to get into the audio space. And there are solutions that are coming out right now um, that could potentially play that role, but it, I don't think there's anything that's really kind of taken um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the market share uh, or provided really the, the right uh, capabilities to the, the brands, what they're looking to accomplish. So, so if I understand it correctly, you know, if a brand comes to frequency, you can help them with that audience sort of audience first creative, right? So that you that they have the right creative and messaging for their different audiences. And then they go buy that they can go buy their media from their different partners, right? Whether it's a DAX or a Spotify or whomever. And then if I understood this correctly, they will serve the ad, but essentially they will call frequency. Frequency will serve the ad to the network and the network serves the ad to the user. They get that right? That's right, that's right, okay. that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so we, we essentially operate as an ad server. And, and what's, what's a nice thing about that, it's like any of the other GCO providers in the, in the, the digital space, like your flash talkings of the world um, or Seltras, you know, you, you're, you're this kind of creative management solution that sits on its own and is agnostic. And so we don't have to be tied to anybody. We're, we're there to help in terms of flexibility and control over what you're distributing. But we are the ones still actively serving. So we touch the listeners uh, and we're able to, you know, basically send them the creative and find out how it performed. Uh, and that's why I think it's really important for, for brands when they're considering the space to think about not just, okay, where am I going to run? What type of creative am I going to run? But it's like, how am I going to actually activate that and be able to try to centralize it, keep it, and, and, and also that it, it, it it frees you up to do more. So again, that flexibility is huge and the control over what you're actually running at that point in time uh, makes a big difference. A lot of audio advertising has been, you know, kind of a, a one and done. You, you throw the audio one message or two messages out there, you let it run for a course of campaign flight of a few weeks, and then you look at the results. You know, we can be much more active. And like, you, you know, with, with brands today do in Facebook, where they're actively looking at how is it performing across certain demographics? What are the different messages that are working? What's resonating? How do I change that? We can do the same thing in, in, in audio. And that's what we offer is like that, that capability 
Uh, and I, honestly, that's why I think this the interesting ties of social and audio in the future, because uh, it's in the same way of, of you know, that brand messaging, it's just a different medium. Um, but audio, again, because it's that intimate environment, we, we can provide benefits that you wouldn't be able to get from somebody just flipping through their phone. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it's quite exciting in that sense. Yeah, you're, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. When it comes to the social side, brands will spend, you know, whether you're doing dynamic creative, pulling in images from your feed, um, or looking at previous behavior, every piece of creative is, is sort of unique to the user, or at least it should be anyway, because you can do it. Um, they should be thinking about audio the same way. Like if you know the user is in Manhattan and it's raining and it's lunchtime, right? You should be able to leverage those parameters. They're there, they're easy. Um, right. You use it to your advantage to create that personalized message. Um, so, so given that structure where you're serving to the ad server, does all that data come back into frequency so the advertiser gets a holistic view of their overall campaign, even if they're buying media from different vendors? Yes. Yeah. I think oh. that's one of the biggest benefits, right? So you're consolidating all the, the data into one central place to be able to look, okay, how to perform on this publisher, this publisher at this time of day, this day of week with these data signals, right? During when it's raining versus when it's beautiful outside. Um, there's a lot of things. You cut it up by DMA. Uh, you know, there's so many things that you can do. All that insight really helps in terms of decisioning, uh, not only just at the creative level, but at the media level, right? When I activate that campaign, now I have a little bit more information. Maybe I want to change the, the targeting so I'm only running it at nighttime or I'm only doing certain things, you know, maybe it's much more weekend focused. Uh, and we've, you know, we've run campaigns where we've seen, uh, we, you know, there was a campaign we ran, we had nine messages and we changed them. The, each message, uh, was slightly different and ran a course of a number of weeks. And then we analyzed the data and we saw that certain messages perform better at certain times of day. And so what we did is we took out a few and then we amped, ramped up the ones that we saw performing at certain times to see that we could hold and increase the performance of the campaign. So that having that knowledge and that insight now at your fingertips, you can make those decisions uh, and you can do that in a shorter window. It doesn't have to be, you know, four, eight weeks later. You could actually do it every week. Um, so, yeah. So I have one last tactical question uh, as it pertains to frequency. If somebody was considering frequency, should they, should they test the media first or should they test the creator first? Um, I guess the more direct way of asking that is should they, should they go test the channels on their own and then come to frequency or should they start with frequency and test the channels through frequency? or in conjunction with? Uh, I mean, you can do both. Uh, you know, I, I, so we're, we're working with a lot of uh, brands today that have already been in audio and are looking to uh, up their game, right? They're looking to enhance what they're doing, the kind of creative that they're running. Uh, and again, like contextual performance, right? So they're looking to use us to do that. Uh, we're also starting to work with some of the, 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 I guess I wouldn't say smaller brands, but Brands that haven't really done much in audio, now they want to explore audio and we're helping them kind of navigate the channel or channels within, within the audio space. Um, so in that case, uh, they can activate their campaign via frequency across those channels, or they can go out to those channels and work with certain publishers and look at how they can leverage frequency in certain ways alongside it. So we have had both and you know, what we'd want to do is, again, we're agnostic player. So we just want to highlight the benefits of working with us. But we also want to highlight the benefits of just doing audio, period, right? And we want the brands to go out there and just dip their toes and see how it works. And if you, if you do try it and you do it in a way that makes sense, you're going to continue to keep coming back for more. Um, you know, you're going to find that opportunity for brand awareness. And you're going to find that opportunity for performance. And you're going to find that nice blend of the two in the audio space. And so, you know, what we, we want to do is kind of push brands into it and then say, if you need, if you want to activate with our system, you want to use our technology, you know, let us know. And we can help you with the creative all the way to the distribution and we can keep it centralized. Um, but look, you know, there's going to be opportunities if you go direct to a publisher that, you know, they, they provide certain inventory that you wouldn't be able to just come to us. Right. So, you know, we, we're not stupid and thinking that we're just, we're going to be that one solution. We just want to be a kind of an adjunct solution that can we always uh, help benefit the brand, brand marketers.
Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. I think about like, if you're a brand, you wouldn't go into Facebook today um, with one piece of creative and you wouldn't let Facebook um, drive that. Obviously they have their own, their own agenda. Um, same, same would hold true here. If you're gonna go test the media space, the audio channel, the media perspective, you should put your best foot forward, right? Have the right creative for the right user. Otherwise you're not judging it on its, on its full merits because you're not ch- testing it the right way. Right. But that's my perspective. All right, before we, before we wrap, where is the audio industry heading from a marketing perspective? Uh, yeah, so I mean, what I find exciting um, from a marketing perspective and what we, what the technology that's coming out that's gonna, the brand marketers can take advantage of. Uh, one is that when we were talking about sort of the audio production, so like being able to centralize and create your campaign, your creative in one place and have the flexibility and control over it. Now there's gonna be self-serve tools that you can use. You don't have to actually interact with them, but you just go in, you put, you put in what you're looking for, you provide your script, you build out your audio, you can do that based on context. And uh, the, the solutions are there to enable the rapid production and quick performance that you're looking for. So you can not only just produce a creative first time, but during the course of the campaign, you can continue to produce a creative with the same talent and the same production quality. That, so that type of uh, quick service for brands is going to be much more accessible and available and to do that across and attached to DSPs and publishers. So that to me is exciting. Um, the second thing I think, you know, the measurement piece that we talked about, you know, that's, that's, that's evolving and that's going to become even more effective for, for brands uh, and what they're doing on a more 360 approach. So having audio as a part of their media mix and being able to keep that measurement consistent with what they're doing in other, other, other spaces. Uh, another big important thing is the, uh, the, the impact that we're going to see with machine learning and with text to speech. Uh, so, you know, we have today capabilities of advanced creative and the ability to use data signals, dynamic creative, et cetera. Uh, that's going to continue to improve. We're going to be able to use third party APIs. So you can do things like triggering based on sports scores. Uh, weather, the, the stock tickers, um, that's going to always be there today and can, can continue to improve. But then when you start to include text-to-speech elements and when you start to include machine learning, what you'll find is now you have the capability of doing even more variants of that the, those ads to the listeners. So instead of doing 10 messages, I can do thousands of messages mm-hmm. and I can run that through the system and rapidly produce and, and roll it out. And then with machine learning, I can also then activate optimization without having somebody manually controlling the keys. Now I can see performance based on certain creatives and then have machines actually change the distribution of those ads based on that performance. So all those things are coming into play right now. Uh, We're doing a lot behind the scenes with each one of those pieces um, from setting up brands with easy to use production tool sets uh, to have that rapid production capability, to having measurement partners in place as well, tied into the campaign, using the advanced creative technology. And then we are right now experimenting with text-to-speech partners uh, and the ability to then um, have machines look at the performance of the campaign, uh, look at the distribution and make this different decisions. Um, and so that's, that's where things are headed and it's gonna become much more powerful and you'll see over time with all those pieces together, the return on your investment will go up, right? You're going to have that control over your campaign creative. You're going to have the, the intelligence coming in from the insights. And when those are playing in that kind of feedback loop, then in your, your performance will just continue to arch up. And you'll see that, uh, um, you know, there's, you can do more and invest more in audio and get, you know, a greater return across either any of the channels. <clears throat> that's awesome. I mean, that's exciting. Um, well, thank you for demystifying the audio channel for us today. Yeah, um, we really appreciate the uh, the 101 here. Um, I'm sure more pe- some people are more savvy than others when it comes to the space, but I think it really answered a lot of the questions. Um, if any any listeners should have any questions or would like to speak with Pete directly, you can reach out to me uh, at Sean at bcogent.co or my business partner Tom Barbaro at Tom at bcogent. Dot co, um, and you can find us on our website at becogent.co. Um, thank you for your time today, Pete, and uh, anyone listening, thank you for uh, spending your time with us. Take care, everyone. Thanks, right. Pete. Thanks, John.
Thanks. See you guys.